The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Our Gospel reading this morning is a continuation from last week. And last week we found Jesus in his hometown, in the temple, reading from the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. And he said to the people who were gathered there, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives and sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that is where our gospel lesson for today picks up. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me, Doctor, hear yourself. And you will say, Do hear also what you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. I invite our young people forward. Okay, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Very good. So, do you ever think that the Bible can be kind of confusing? Not me. Oh, not you? That's good. Kind of. Yes. Kind of? Kind of. Yeah? Well, I think that today's lesson from Luke, the one that I just read, I think that story is a really confusing story. And I don't not really understand it. And I don't really understand. And I don't really understand. Yeah. And it eat yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't always understand. Do you think it goes with David and Goliath? How does it go with that? Um, Goliath and David was the only one. Yeah, David was the only one who killed Goliath. Yeah. Yeah, who could? Yeah. That's no true. one thought who could do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, one of the things, even though it's a confusing story, one of the things that I was thinking about was how Jesus got mad. Jesus got really, really mad at the people in today's lesson. So I was wondering if you ever get mad. Do you ever get mad? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think I ever get mad. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you get mad? I do get mad. <laughs> I get mad. <laughs> Why do I get mad? Yeah, I get mad too. Well, Jesus gets mad too. I am blushing right now. Yeah, he, 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 he okay. He got mad a lot. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. Well, hey. Is it bad to get mad? No. no. It's okay. It's okay to get mad, isn't it? Right? But oh, say that. Say that again. Not if you use the force. But not if you use the force. Ah, Star Wars fan, I can tell. I am so, too. when you get mad, it's okay to get mad. I mean, Jesus got mad, and we know that Jesus didn't sin. So, part of what it means to be a human being is to get I mad. I like, I watched this Star Wars commercial. There was the 10 kids, I was pretending to be yeah. the robot. Yeah, that was funny. Okay, so. So, <laughs> I feel like this is not working. <laughs> I just use yourself. I just use yourself. Let's just practice this together. I want everybody to stop what you're doing. And we're going to all take a deep breath in. Okay, ready? And now let it out. 
So when we get mad, the important thing to remember is that love is the most important thing. I do not know what to do. And even when we get mad, we can still be loving, right? We don't yep. have to use our hands in ways that hurt people, like by hitting. Well, we don't have I to. think some people do that. Yes, some people do. That's right. And but we, do. but that's not the good thing to do, right? So when we get mad, let's practice breathing. And we can practice breathing in the love of Jesus. We can pretend like we're breathing in love and we're getting rid of all the bad stuff that's inside of us. So can we practice breathing one more time? Ready? Good. So we breathe in love and out all the bad stuff. And that is one of the ways that we can use our anger for good things and not hurt other people. Okay. Let's have a prayer, shall we? Oh, yeah. And if you want to take a shaker or a ribbon back to your chair again today, you can do that for, for the songs, okay? But, but first we're going to pray. But first we're going to pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you showed us that when we get mad, it's okay. And that you love us no matter what. We pray that you would help us in our times of anger to remember that you fill us with love and to share that love with others, even when we're mad at them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I kind of already let the cat out of the bag when it comes to this particular gospel lesson. And that is that I find this lesson to be one of the most confusing pieces of scripture I have ever read. I cannot understand why Jesus would be so antagonistic toward a crowd of people who think he's doing a really good job. The text says that they were all amazed at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. And then Jesus sort of turns on a dime and starts yelling at them. And this text makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I don't really like conflict. And I don't like to start conflict. And I wish that Jesus could have been just a little bit Midwest nice and kept his mouth shut and just kept going. Do you know what I mean when I say Midwest nice? It's a phrase which refers to the fact that a lot of Midwesterners just keep their mouth shut and move on rather than confronting the problem or the issue that is in front of them. I was really, really good at that once upon a time. And I still can be good at that when I don't want to have conflict. You just smile and nod and keep going, right? You all know what I'm talking about. I wish Jesus would have done that in today's text. Because I honestly just don't know what to do with his anger. That is until I take into account Jesus' circumstances. He was in his hometown preaching, and it takes a little bit of reading between the lines because none of us were there. But I am guessing that when the people of his hometown heard him preach and realized that this was Joseph's son, they started to get a little bit proud of Jesus, as one would assume that the town would. He was famous. He was bringing fame to the town. He was probably giving the town a little bit of an economic boost by having all the people who follow Jesus come. I imagine, I imagine that the people wanted to try to tell Jesus what to do. Did you hear how Jesus said, Surely you will say to me now, Doctor, cure yourself, and do the deeds you did in Capernaum, just like that. As if Jesus could turn on and turn off his miraculous deeds. As if Jesus belonged to them, as if they could control him. And then I can imagine why Jesus would get a little bit upset. He reminds the people that you cannot own or control God. 
He reminds them of two instances in the history of Israel when the Israelites wanted to own and control God. Of course God came to save me, they thought, until Jesus pointed out the time of the widow who was saved, who was not an Israelite, but was indeed one of their enemies. And the same with King Naaman, the leper who was cured a Syrian, another enemy of Israel. Okay, so maybe we can start to understand Jesus' anger. But what does that have to do with us today? And how is Jesus getting angry good news for us today? Well... I started thinking about what our lives are like today and what is the context in which we live. Foremost in the news this week, a lot, has been the news of Flint, Michigan, the town whose water has been poisoned by lead for at least the last two years, something that was covered up in a great conspiracy. I think about the terrorism which continues to come across our screens. I think about all the political ads, and we do have a landline at our house, and all the phone calls. I think about the politicians' way of speaking with each other, at each other, and to the public. I think about our community here at St. John as we meet today to think about our future as a church together here and what God might be calling us to do. I think about our own lives and the things that each of us have going on. And I can see where Jesus' anger might be good news. Because as I think about those things, sometimes I get angry. Why is there such injustice in this country that people are ignored and their lives are altered forever? Why is there such hate in this country that people are spouting killing everyone as a solution? Why is there so much pain? and death and brokenness? And why are lives not just easy and simple and straightforward? Why does it have to be this way? And then Jesus' anger becomes good news. You see, as much as I wish Jesus would have just kept his mouth shut and moved on, by Jesus becoming angry, And facing the oppression he saw at the time, he gave us the gift of life. Remember, Jesus had just proclaimed good news to the poor, freedom to the oppressed, recovery of sight to the blind. That is the news which Jesus came to give. And we, as people, like to make it all about us, don't we? I saw a church sign on a church that shall remain unnamed but that said, heaven is a place for the prepared. And I get what they were trying to say, kind of. But when heaven is only a place for the prepared, what happened to God's grace? And what happened to God's love? As much as I wish Jesus coming into the world was the thing that made everything easy, As much as I wish Jesus coming into the world meant that everything would be okay and flowers and roses and clouds and pie. What we hear in the text for today is that Jesus coming into the world means that God stands in solidarity with everyone. And I wish that Jesus wouldn't have opened his mouth because since he opened his mouth, we, people who live in his light and his love and his life, are called to do the same. We are called to use our voices to speak out against oppression and injustice. And it can be really hard to open your mouth and say something, can't it? 
I wish Jesus would have just kept walking. But the good news of Jesus Christ, his freedom, his light, and his love cannot remain only for me or for you or for any one group of people. Because the God who became a person in human Jesus is the God of all people and all nations and all tribes. That is the God who came to set everyone free. And so we are called, brothers and sisters, to use our voice. Tomorrow is the end to this great political season with the caucuses. Well, at least there will only be two people campaigning rather than, how, I don't even know how many are right now. We are called to use our voices. And so, yes, I am asking you to go caucus. If you need help finding your place of caucusing, if you need help getting there, please let me know. But we, as people of God, can keep silent no more. In the face of oppression and injustice, silence is simply not an option for those of us who are privileged enough to have a voice. I wish Jesus would have just kept on walking. Because it's a hard row to hoe. It is hard to stand up. Especially when you look at the Lutheran church, our particular denomination, which is 96% white. A fact of which I am not necessarily proud. But we are a church that has privilege and voice. And we are reminded in this text of Jesus' righteous anger that God is not just our God. But God is the God of the oppressed and the free. God is the God of the slave and the slave owner. God is the God of all. And wherever you are in that, maybe you are all of the above, God is standing in solidarity with you. Which means that if you are oppressed, you will hear good news. Which means that if you are already free, you become the voice to bring good news. Which means that Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh is with us. It is not an easy life, living the life of a disciple. And in fact, it ended with Jesus on the cross. But it is exactly there that we find the life that Christ came to bring. We find the God who is not in the cut and clear, dried pieces of politics and life and racism and sexism and human trafficking. We find that God is in the midst of all of that to bring life to everyone and everything. That is the life in which we are invited to live. It is the life we are invited to share. It is the life we are invited to give because Christ first gave it to us. Let us go forth, dear brothers and sisters, encouraged by Jesus' anger, knowing that God's voice makes a difference, that you, children of God, are deserving of love and respect, and God is using you to change the world. That is the good news for all.